economist uh, Tom Senzola, I'm the director of finance for something called the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. Um, I didn't do the name, um, but anyway, it's ieefa.org. Most of what I'm going to say is on um, the website. Um, basically, I have a couple of points, but I, I just want to introduce uh, myself and what we do a little bit. Um, well, first, I, I, I kind of want to get, get a better sense. I've been involved in this stuff for a very long time, and by this stuff I mean municipal and state finance and, uh, and uh, the um, climate uh, movement. Um, the reason you're here today um, is because the um, our global and uh, national political institutions um, can't come to a, um, a, a conclusion about what we need to do about um, climate change and the uh, move away from fossil fuels. Um, and so it falls to you, and it falls to the pension funds, and it falls um, to um, all of us. Um, it's not fair, it's not right. I heard people say, we don't understand the science, we don't understand that. Well, you know, um, I, I think that that's right. We have a, the benefit of living in what still looks like a, a democracy. Um, and, um, and so we can um, speak out about this stuff and, and organize um, and demand some answers. You know, um, I was thinking about this when, when I started. Um, um, these kinds of meetings took place and we got the social security system. It started in New York. This kind of, uh, these kinds of discussions got us building codes that are now the dream of the world for building um, and also to protect people from you know, fires and damage. And, uh, uh, New York City is also the place that started immunizations of children um, from, uh, from all of the diseases that we know. New York City and New York State is also the home of uh, immigration for the, for the people around the world still. Um, so we lead and we, and incidentally, uh, when I get to the end, you're going to see New York profits also. Because um, I do business, that's what I do. From a, um, for a long time, I was um, involved in running the New York City Pension Fund and the New York City Comptroller's Office, and then was the same at the state level. Um, and so I was the fiduciary and had fiduciary responsibilities and kind of understand a little bit about it. But I also have a lot of skin in the game. I called my brother before I came, who's my family historian. He says, we have two uncles, one aunt, my mom and my dad in the pension system. We have him, my sister-in-law, me, my son-in-law, which is my, also my granddaughter and daughter. Um, and my, he said, I don't even know how many cousins. I got a lot of skin in this game. Um, and, um, and so for the last 10 years, I've been involved in this organization um, called the Institute for Energy Economics. And what we do is we look for alternatives for fossil fuels. We're a bunch of finance and energy experts. Um, and we work with uh, organizations like 350 and uh, many other groups all over the world. We are the people who can go into the courts and I do, most of the, what you're going to hear I do under oath. So, um, and this is where we are in the United States, Canada, Alaska, uh, Puerto Rico. And this is where we are around the world. We're in uh, um, China, Norway, Kosovo, Turkey, India. We just opened up. Uh, Australia, we have a lot of work going on there. We just opened up offices in Philippines and Indonesia. Um, this is where, this is how the climate movement is organizing, and we do um, financial and economic and energy supports all over the world. That's just the words. Um, anyway, I want to do three things today. I want to talk to you a little bit about the structure of an institutional pension fund. Um, um, I want to talk to you about the changing profitability of fossil fuels. And I want to talk to you about what the fiduciary options are and maybe, you know, where we can um, uh, get some movement going. So the structure of an of a institutional pension fund, and um, um, let me just go through this quickly. Um, oh, it, I guess when we sent it, it butchered it in the, in the movement. Anyway, um, anyway, the most common types of funds are pension funds, endowments, insurance companies, mutual funds, and the like. Um, they are all structured to support beneficiaries. In our case, the pension fund uh, um, supports employees and retirees. Um, 401k plans and that um, sponsor um, uh, retirees, um, foundation investments sponsor, you know, grantees. Um, so it's money being developed and then out. Uh, how do I get rid of that? Just click agree. Huh? If you just click I agree, 
I agree. Oh, there's no um, arrow. Does it do it if I do it manually? Nope. Anyway, the um, <coughs> okay. Huh, what should I? Anyway, anyway, the, so the boards of trustees are fiduciaries, um, and they're the people who make the decisions. They hire the people who are the staff um, of the funds and the service contractors. Um, the service contractors are the money managers, the actuaries, and what have you, the, the experts who come in and help the boards of trustees you know, make their decisions. Um, it's not the other way around. The money managers do not control and do not, um, um, uh, are not the final decision makers, it is the fiduciaries. Henry's a fiduciary, um, and I don't think Helen's on the board, but anyway, um, but often it's the other way around, and so you have the money managers dictating policy, and the money managers are Wall Street. That's what that is. So that's, that's your biggest and fun biggest fundamental problem. The fiduciaries have to act like it, and the um, money managers have to realize that they are for hire. Uh, and they need to do the bidding of the boards as opposed to the other way around. This is just a basic fund structure. Um, it got messed up again in the translation. Basically, you have um, funds are divided into asset classes, domestic and international equities, bonds, alternative investments, private equity, hedge funds, real estate. So this is just an uh, abstract example that I used. Um, and they try to get a return target of 8% uh, or thereabout. That's the return you have to get. On investment from all of the um, from all the best investments in all the portfolio, um, but here's what I really want to want to want to uh, stress to you. You heard a whole lot of discussion before about fiduciary responsibility. Um, the notion of a fiduciary is that you, if you are the fiduciary, are in charge of somebody else's needs, somebody else's money, somebody else's um, guardianship. Um, that's the fiduciary responsibility. You care, as, and you are held to certain standards for that. And you are to act cautiously, as Henry, I think, uh, uh, was an evidence of somebody who's acting cautiously. But you also have a judge, you also have a, um, uh, a the duty of good faith. Which is, to, which is to take all things considered, which are both the financial responsibilities that you have and the mission of your fund, um, and that's a judgment. That's not a mechanical formula. You're a human being and you have a care standard that you have to meet. And of course, there's loyalty, conflicts of interest. You don't hire your brother-in-law when, you when you have a better um, um, candidate in front of you. You probably shouldn't hire your brother-in-law anyway. Um, and then there's transparency issues so that everybody knows what it is you're doing. Most funds are not transparent. I thought it was instructive that a city council member and a sitting state senator didn't know uh, very much about their funds. And I think Helen was correct in saying that at the city level, there is just not a lot of transparency. Um, anyway, and at the state level as well for different reasons. Anyway, but the point of the fiduciary, and this is something that I think you should just hold, is that you don't have to hold or make an investment where the benefits outweigh the risks. If you do, you could be breaching your fiduciary responsibility. And, and, and that's what you need to keep in mind as you go forward with making these kinds of judgments. So, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the fossil fuel industry. The fossil fuel industry has historically been one of the most important contributors to pension funds and every other fund in the world. And it's changing. And by fossil fuels, I mean the oil, gas, and coal industries. And it's changing. So I got into this business in the late 80s and the 1990s, and when I got into this business, seven of the top 10 corporations in the Standard & Poor's 500 were oil and gas companies. It's very important for an institutional investor. That tell them that those are, those are um, significant places where all the index money goes, all the formulas go. Today there's only one, it's called ExxonMobil, which we're all familiar with. And um, that tells you that from the point of view of world growth, 
um, these guys are less relevant than they used to be. And now, but, but oil and gas is still a big part of the investment. If you look at the Standard & Poor's 500, it's 7% of the Standard & Poor's 500. So you could generally take that as a benchmark for most funds, although it's give or take. And as I think it was Helen said, or was it, I don't know if it was Helen or, um, or Liz who said that, you know, they didn't quite know how much was um, invested in fossil fuels. I think that's true, um, and it's not necessarily a pernicious thing because they're organized around those asset classes, but it's time to drill down because of, because of uh, changes that are taking place. So let me try to explain one company, ExxonMobil, I'll do this relatively quickly, um, and say to you that the, the question that Helen wants to ask to the uh, to the city controller has to do with um, how much value um, ExxonMobil is providing to the city of New York has provided to the city of New York and will provide to the city of New York in the future that's a fiduciary question right well it's going to be a lot less than it used to be and I'm talking billions nation but worldwide for Exxon um, they historically have um, shelled out to shareholders 30 billion a year for the last 10 years that's a lot of money that's one of the biggest um, um, cash machines for institutional investors in the world um, they're now down to about 12 billion so when the when you want to ask a question Will the fossil fuel, and they're the leader, well, will the fossil, many of these other companies are freezing their dividends and what have you. So when you want to ask the question, are these guys worth as much as they used to be, the answer is no. Their revenues, profits, cash reserves, capex, all down. By the end of the month, I'm going to have a, you'll have a study from us on this. Um, Long-term debt is on rise. That means that company was borrowing uh, had a steady uh, long-term debt of about eight billion a year. Now it's almost it's over forty. That means they're borrowing to pay the dividends and to pay the profits out to the shareholders. It means their business operation no longer covers their expenses, their capital investment, and the dividends to the shareholders. And you'll see in our study it will show that they really never did uh, have much. They have their major driver is oil prices. They're low. They will continue to remain low as far as we can see. Um, and they're not going to go up, up over 100 or 150 where they make most of their profits. Um, they are in the midst of climate um, issues. They, they've been uh, so active on the issue that now the New York State Attorney General, Massachusetts Attorney General, and the, and the Securities and Exchange Commission is investigating them. As a shareholder, you ought to worry about that. So you got down profits and investigations. That's ExxonMobil right now. That's what you got going forward in the oil and gas industry. Now, this I wanted to show you, and this is a little bit unprecedented. This is the last five years of ExxonMobil versus the Standard & Poor's Index. As you can see, they are lagging the Standard & Poor's Index. For the past 30 years, they have been dominant. They drove it. The red line was above the blue line. They drove world profits. Things have changed. The drivers of gas and oil prices and profits are four things, and you can, and after I get done, you can consider what this means. So there's supply and demand. Right now, we're oversupplied all over the world for oil and for uh, for oil, um, and the demand. The Exxon and uh, oil industry will tell you demand is going up. Other experts will tell you um, there are reasons to believe that it, it is um, it's going to be flat or go down. So um, it's at best contested terrain, you don't know. Politics, um, right now, the oil industry has historically been organized and well-coordinated and capable of manipulating prices all over the world, and so prices go up and prices go down in some relationship to supply and demand, but in, in relationship to political strategies of many of the countries like OPEC, they are in disarray, and the nature of the political conflicts that are going on now and will continue to go on have to do with um, continuing process, um, 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 oversupply and continued low prices. That's the net effect of Iran fighting with Russia, fighting with Saudi Arabia, fighting with us, and all of the uh, and all of the um, interactions that are going on there. Geology, 
oil and gas are more expensive to get out of the ground than they were 10 years ago. Exxon right now has a third of its investments in oil reserves in Canadian oil sands, which is the most expensive way to extract oil in the world right now, and it is basically with the, um, with the low oil prices a uh, set of assets that will not be developed, and is an, it is in fact the target of the SEC investigation and the New York State <coughs> Attorney General's um, investigation that those assets that they are claiming are on their books are not valid assets. And then we have the kind of initiatives that Liz and I were talking about around the world, the Paris Agreement and the low carbon initiatives. What that does from a market perspective is it basically says, it basically um, says the next time the uh, markets come <coughs> around, you may have large scale competition from wind and solar and energy efficiency all over the world and that the rebounds that are going to take place, that have taken place in the past, will not take place in the oil and gas industry because there will be a transformed market that's going to keep a cap on prices. That frustrates their ability to go forward. Um, coal industry is more of the same here. We're just looking, we just found this one, we were on this one shot. I was trying to find a better one, but I sort of ran out of time. Eventually, that bottom line going down, that's the coal industry. The law top line is going up of various measures of the world economy. Um, that's going on now. Um, there has been some resurgence in the coal industry in the last year. Um, but the uh, but that's like going from they had lost 95 percent of value now they've lost about 80 percent of value i can assure you that most of you sitting in this room right now as fiduciaries could find stocks that don't lose 80 percent I'm, uh, I'm 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 uh, i'm pretty sure most people in this room can do that so anyway um so the profits of the industry tell us this. They tell us that they're shrinking in both the oil, that the industry is shrinking. It's gonna be smaller tomorrow. It's smaller today than it was yesterday, and it'll be smaller tomorrow. And it'll be smaller in terms of profits and, um, and, uh, and use in the economy. Um, so what kind of options do fiduciaries have? And this one, this is the standard option from the money managers who tell your trustees what to do. Do nothing. And they argue this from, a, from, a, from an almost logical financial standpoint. They have formulas, they have indexes. The indexes, if the stock goes down, we just get rid of the stock and, the, um, and, uh, and everything works out fine, right? Well, most funds are having a tough time making their targets. And as I said to you, historically, the oil and gas industry has been a major contributor to pension funds. It, we, we, we were looking at 8% returns. Those funds over the years, those investments were in the 20%. Right? They drove the markets. They were a major source of profitability for our fund here and for funds around the world and for the world economy. That is changing. They are not that profitable anymore, and it has major implications. Um, but it is also at the time for um, fiduciaries um, to begin to protect themselves. So what we've been arguing is that shareholders should act, um, that there are financial fundamentals that are showing stress, um, there's a weak outlook for the oil and gas industry as well as the coal industry. That the, that, the, that the holdings are too significant in the funds for simply to say that the index funds are the way to do it. They will lose value, um, more value for you on the fund than, um, than, than, they will, than they will be able to act to, um, to offset losses. Um, the, and there were also bonds and private equity investments, which I'd be more than asking. So the question becomes, What's management's plan to turn around conventional oil, oil sands, and natural gas competition operations? And the answer is they don't have one. Um, but you need to ask those questions. So we would argue you protect the fund, and the asset allocation study that Henry referred to before is the place to do it. The, the, the fiduciary tells the money managers, we want to know what a zero fossil fuel fund looks like and we want to know how we meet our targets in that I, and I would tell you 10 years ago you couldn't ask that question and get an, uh, an answer um, but you can do that now and they can reconstruct the portfolios it's not something that's done overnight and isn't something that's done easily but it's definitely doable um, you need to ask the companies currently about finances and climate change and the divestment decision that needs to get made by the fiduciaries comes out of those two dynamics. You know, I, I think if, if funds go through their own processes, um, they will come to the conclusion to divest. Um, but I would, and, and I think we need to keep the uh, pressure up to ask the right questions and to do the right thing. And then just finally, um, I always say, 
that the environmental movement is probably the best investment bankers that I've ever been involved with, and I've been doing this for 25 years. And I'll just end with this. Um, in uh, 1990, I think it was, that we were criticized for um, opposing a garbage incinerator at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And uh, we won, and the headline in the New York Post was, Ideologues at Work, meaning us. Um, today, I believe it's um, worth several billion dollars and employs thousands of people. It's not a bad deal.